science room is rocking it tonight, today at the convention center. Unbelievable. Well, we're here to hear uh, Dr. Michio Kaku, who is just amazing. I love this guy. I, I, um, just a footnote, I'm Joel Lockenbach from the Washington Post. Um, assume you knew. Um, I, but I, I, write, I, I love the big cosmic questions, and there's no one better at asking and answering the big cosmic amazing questions than Dr. Kaku. He is just a genius at it. Uh, he's a co-founder of string field theory. He's a theoretical physicist at City University of New York. He's written multiple uh, bestsellers. Um, he refers to them as New York Times bestsellers. Well, I don't use that term. Um, <laughs> but but th this book begins, the first line, th this, his new book is uh, um, the, uh, the Future of the Mind is the name of the book. And the first line is, the two greatest mysteries in all of nature are the mind and the universe. So we start from that. And he, he asked the questions, do we have a soul? What happens to us after we die? Who am I anyway? Where do we fit into this great cosmic scheme? And that's on the first page, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is the stuff that, that people, you know, when you're in college at three o'clock in the morning when you're in the dorm room, you know, and you and you stand up all night drinking, you know, healthy carrot juice or whatever you do, right? <laughs> this is what you talk about. And anyway, so he, he he's a, 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 an amazing man, and uh, let's hear from him. All right. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First of all, I have a confession to make. Uh, sometimes all these accolades can backfire. Recently, New York Magazine voted me as one of the 100 smartest people in New York. So I thought, what an honor. However, in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> And next year, I understand that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. <laughs> now today, I'm going to talk about the future, the future of your mind. However, making predictions is dangerous. Let me quote from that great philosopher of the Western world, Yogi Berra. <laughs> Yogi Berra once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> well, I'm a physicist. We can talk about the future of the universe billions of years from now. So let me quote from that other great philosopher, Woody Allen. <laughs> Woody Allen once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. Well, you may say to yourself, what does a physicist do anyway? What have you done for me lately? Well, we physicists invented the transistor. We invented the laser. We helped to construct the first computers and the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. And along the way, don't forget, we invented television. We invented radio, radar, microwaves. X-ray machines, don't forget, we created the space program and the GPS system. And we physicists love to make predictions. When we assemble the internet, one physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> so before I begin, giving you a guided tour to the in incredible, sensational developments in neuroscience, let me tell you a cautionary story about a physicist. Over 200 years ago, we had the great French Revolution. 
And one day there were three gentlemen about to lose their head to the guillotine. There was a priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, <laughs> about to lose their head to the guillotine. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words before we slice your head off? And he said, yes, yes. He said, God, God from above shall set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before he hit the neck of the priest. <gasps> the crowd gasped. They had never seen this before. And so the mob said, let the priest go, because today God has spoken. And now let's see about the lawyer. Yes, <laughs> the lawyer. They put the lawyer's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, maybe the spirit of justice, justice and mercy shall set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before it hit the neck of the lawyer. This time, the mob went crazy. Dancing in the streets of Paris, people were saying, God has spoken, justice and mercy have spoken today. And now let's see about the physicist. Well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God. And I know even less about the law. But I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. And then the physicist said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. <laughs> Big mistake. Big mistake. Well, the rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And it just goes to show you, sometimes, sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> Nonetheless, today I will open the mouths of 300 of the world's top scientists that I've interviewed for BBC television, the Science Channel, the Discovery Channel, about what sits on your shoulder. And afterwards, I'll be signing books. I'll be signing your book. And then afterwards, you can go to eBay and auction it off <laughs> for money. You can actually make money today, OK? So today, we are going to talk about the future of your mind. And the previous book I wrote, if I can bring that up, was Physics of the Future, talking about the next 50 to the next 100 years. Well, you know, it's often said that in the book-buying world, the word physics would never enter the New York Times bestseller list. Well, I did it twice. <laughs> physics of the Impossible talks about teleporters, starships, even time travel. What happens if you go backwards in time? And you meet your teenage mother before you're born, and she falls in love with you. <laughs> well, if your teenage mother falls in love with you before you're born, you're in deep doo-doo if that happens. <laughs> but today, let us talk about the greatest of all mysteries, what sits on your shoulder. Believe it or not, we've learned more about the brain in the last 10 to 15 years than in all of human history combined. That's the power of physics. Radio. Radio allows us to penetrate right into the thinking mind. And then we look for echoes. Echoes of radio ricocheting off oxygen molecules in an MRI machine to give us gorgeous, gorgeous pictures of thoughts ricocheting like a ping pong ball inside the human mind. And believe it or not, your brain only uses 20 watts of power. And yet to simulate it with a digital computer, it would require a computer a city block by a city block. It would consume the energy of a nuclear power plant. And it would have to be cooled by a river. And your brain does it with 20 watts. So when someone calls you a dim bulb, that's a compliment. So how is it possible? And what is consciousness anyway? Well, in the history of science, 
There have been 20,000 papers written about consciousness. Never in the history of science have so many devoted so much to produce so little. <laughs> However, in my book, I actually give you a definition, a metric by which you can measure numerically levels of consciousness. I'm a physicist. We just don't wax eloquent and philosophical about consciousness. We define it. We quantify it, and it's all in my book. And so the two great mysteries are the universe and the mind. And some people think, well, I work in what is called string theory. What's so strange about strings? Well, look at nature. At the fundamental level, DNA is a string. A string allows you to encode vast amounts of information on the DNA molecule. And the unit of thought in the brain is the neuron which is also a string. And so we think that string theory lies at the fundamental of all biological and physical knowledge. And so let's talk about the movies. The movies are always a little bit ahead of us, and they talk about telepathy, reading minds. Did you know that we can now do that in the laboratory? They talk about telekinesis, moving objects with the mind. And not only that, but in Hollywood movies, they talk about not just telepathy, but also uploading memories. We can now do that for the first time in history. Just last year at Wake Forest University, the first memory was uploaded into a mouse brain. And we put the, inserted the memory back into the mouse, and the mouse remembered it perfectly. And last week, last week, the United States Pentagon announced a $40 million initiative to record memories for GIs from Iraq and Afghanistan. Recording memories is going to happen in our lifetime. This is like the Matrix, uploading reality. Have you ever thought to yourself late at night, late at night when you're all by yourself, have you ever had that weird, bizarre thought that maybe Maybe you're the only one that's real. That life is like the Matrix, just a movie uploaded into your mind. And maybe someone's trying to test you to see whether you're smart enough to figure out that you really are the only one. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had that weird thought? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever had that weird thought late at night. Well, you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, you're cra you think you're the only one in the world? That's ridiculous. You see, I'm the only one in the world. I'm actually in bed right now. I'm actually imagining I'm here in Washington, D.C. at the convention center speaking to an audience. Well, realize that this is now possible. The first memory was uploaded into a mouse brain, and the short-term goal is to do it with monkeys and then for Alzheimer's patients. The short-term goal, not the long-term, the short-term goal is to create a brain pacemaker. That's why the military is dumping $40 million into this, to create a brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's patients. And President Barack Obama and the European Union have announced a $1 billion initiative, the Brain Initiative, to create a new genome project. In the future, you'll have two disks. One disk is your genome with all your genes on it. And the other disk is your connectome. A billion dollars are now being put into creating a second disk, a connectome with all your sensations and all your memories, basically all your thoughts on a second disk. And when you die, when you die, your genome and your connectome live on. In some sense, you are immortal. But is it really you? Well, to quote President Bill Clinton, it all depends on how you define you. <laughs> but nonetheless, let us think about what happens when you upload memories. This is the former governor of California <laughs> having the memory of being married to Sharon Stone suddenly uploaded into his mind in the movie Total Recall. So yes, there are consequences if you upload memories of an entire marriage 
But in the future, it's conceivable that we'll upload the memory of a vacation that you never had, or the mathematics course that you never passed. <laughs> this is something that is actually potentially real. Money is now being dumped into it. The first results coming out of Wake Forest University and the University of Southern California. And exoskeletons. If you saw the World Cup, how many people here saw the World Cup soccer games this summer? Did you see the opening ceremony? In the opening ceremony, a man who was totally paralyzed, a quadriplegic, a quadriplegic goes up and kicks the ball and starts the soccer games in front of a billion people. That person was paralyzed. He was wearing an exoskeleton designed at Duke University, controlled by his brain alone. You know, Christopher Reeve, the handsome actor who played Superman in the movies, he died. But before he died, he dreamed of the day when his mind would allow him to bypass his spinal cord so he can walk again. Unfortunately, he died too soon. We can now do it. We can now create exoskeletons. And the military, again, has dumped over $150 million to create exoskeletons like this for our wounded warriors. And surrogates, that is, controlling a robot mentally. This is from the movie Surrogates, starring Bruce Willis. This is the future, perhaps, of the space program. It's too dangerous to put humans into outer space all the time. Why not put robots? And then have the robots guided mentally by an astronaut sitting in his hot tub in his living room. <laughs> so you could explore the universe just mentally, and that's the thesis behind Avatar, the movie Avatar, and also the movie Surrogates, that is mentally controlling robots, and we can do that today. And then telekinesis, the ability to control objects with the mind. We'll talk about this in a moment. This is from the movie Carrie, where a high school kid who's been picked on all these years has her final revenge by destroying the whole high school class at the senior prom. What's the lesson here? <laughs> the lesson here is never bring a telekinetic to the senior prom. So even Superman movies have gotten wind of this revolution. Every high school, every kid knows that Superman's father died when Krypton blew up. I mean, every kid knows this. But in the latest Superman movie, his father lives on as a hologram whose memory is inside a computer, a memory that lives on, a personality, memory, sensation, all played by Russell Crowe. <laughs> and so here is Russell Crowe, the father of Superman, living. And this could be the future of the Library of Congress. When you go to the Library of Congress, you may sit down and have a wonderful conversation with somebody like Einstein, somebody like Winston Churchill, George Washington, because all their memories, sensations have been recorded, and there you are talking to a hologram, having a great afternoon tea with Abraham Lincoln. This is possible. And the question of mind without body. Science fiction writers love this concept, and believe it or not, if you have two disks, one with your genome and one with your connectome, and they live on after you die, in some sense, the mind is living beyond the body. This is the dream of the ancients, the dream of science fiction writers, and this is now conceivable. So let's talk about the brain. First of all, blood flow can be analyzed by MRI scans. On the left is your brain, the blood flow in your brain when you tell the truth. Not much happens. But on the right is when you tell a lie. Ah yes, when you tell a lie. When you tell a lie, first you have to know the truth. Then you have to create the lie. Then you have to create the cover-up and the consistency with the lie with all the previous lies you've been telling all these years. <laughs> That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> so there's your brain on the right telling a lie. Now, what have we learned from these brain scans? Well, we learned that the most ancient part of the brain is the back of your brain, the so-called reptilian brain. The brain has evolved from the back to the front. 
when infants are born, the back of the brain is most developed. That's the reptilian brain. When you have a car accident and you have whiplash, your balance, your sense of territoriality, aggression, simple things like that in the back of the brain are affected. And as the brain grows from infancy into adolescence, the center part of the brain develops. The limbic system, the monkey brain, the brain of emotions, the brain of etiquette, politeness, social norms. That's the center of the brain. And then finally, when you become an adult, the prefrontal cortex at the front of the brain develops. So we can now test old wives' tales by looking at the living brain. One old wives' tale says, every parent knows this, that their teenage kids suffer from brain damage. <laughs> it's true. You can actually show that as the brain develops from the back to the front, teenagers do not have a well-formed prefrontal cortex. It's another old wives' tale that when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. <laughs> it's true. When a man talks to a pretty girl, blood literally drains from the prefrontal cortex and he becomes mentally retarded, okay? You can measure this by looking at blood flow. It's absolutely true, okay? So all these old wives' tales can now be systematically analyzed looking at MRI scans. And then we have two hemispheres, one on the left and one on the right. Now, normally the two hemispheres talk to each other, but in epileptics, it gets out of control. They have seizures, so scientists have to cut, cut the connection between the left and the right hemispheres. And then something bizarre, something weird happens. The two brains that are now cut begin to create two different personalities. It's amazing, documented cases. One man comes home, greets his wife, with one arm, he embraces her. With the other arm, he socks her in the face. A documented case. Another documented case, one man, his left brain was an atheist. His right brain was a believer. Can you imagine dying and going to heaven? Only half your brain goes to heaven. And sooner or later, right here in Washington, D.C., I'm sure we'll find some person who has a left brain that is Republican and a right brain that's Democrat all inside the same skull, each controlling two different arms. Can you imagine them going to the polling booth and the two of them fight over which, which lever to pull? That's gonna happen, that will happen. And this is the 1950s. In the 1950s, we had these really horrible looking gadgets placed over the brain that measures radio brain impulses, electromagnetic signals from the brain. Now we do it with implants and headbands. In the upper left, you can now play video games mentally. It picks up radio from the brain, it's deciphered by a chip, and you can play video games by thinking about it. And in Japan, on the upper right, you can buy a headband with two ears on it, and at a party, when you meet someone who's interesting, the two ears go boing, 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 like that. <laughs> and then when you talk to someone who's really boring, the two ears go like that. So in Japan, you always know if you're gonna go home alone after a party. <laughs> and in my class, in my class, I'm gonna make sure that my students wear these helmets so I know exactly who's gonna fail and exactly who's gonna pass my course. And on the lower left, Silicon Valley is getting wind of this. They realize that we can now, by putting these sensors on your head, when you walk into a room, you can turn on the lights, you can turn on the internet, surf the web, you can write email, you can read email, you can play video games, you can operate household appliances, and in the future, you'll be able to drive a car, mentally. This is today. And Silicon Valley is saying, well, maybe in the future, when we perfect this technology, the mouse will disappear. And Madison Avenue is getting wind of this. And they want to make this fashionable at some point. And even my colleague Stephen Hawking. Stephen has now lost control of his fingertips. He can only blink. That is, his sole means of communication is blinking. 
So my friends, we're all physicists, we hooked him up to a computer, mentally. The next time you see him on TV, look at his right glass. His right glass has a chip in it. That chip picks up radio messages from his brain and allows him to type on a laptop computer mentally, bypassing his fingers, bypassing uh, any mechanical modes by thinking he's able to type. And we can now even do this with paraplegics. The military is very interested, $150 million the Pentagon has pledged to put a chip right on top of the brain to mechanical arms and legs. This man is totally paralyzed. He cannot scratch his nose. He cannot communicate with his loved ones. He's a prisoner, just like Stephen, a prisoner in his own body. But at Brown University, they put a chip in his brain, connected it to a laptop computer. He can now control his wheelchair, operate kitchen appliances, and surf the web and play video games. And this person can now operate mechanical arms. Mechanical arms, she is totally paralyzed. She communicates by blinking, just like what Stephen does. And she can now feed herself. For the first time in history, she can now feed herself mentally. And the Pentagon, as I said, has dumped $150 million into the Revolutionary Prosthetics Program so that injured soldiers can bypass the spinal cord and control exoskeletons. And at the soccer games, as I mentioned, a billion people witnessed a historic event with the power of the mind, a person setting off the world's soccer games just this past summer. And then realize that even beyond this, lies the capability of controlling robots mentally. This is Japan. And in Japan, this worker puts on a helmet, picks up radio from his brain, and then he controls Asimo, the robot here shown on the right, mentally controlling a robot. This could be the future of firemen. Firemen, ambulance workers, emergency workers may eventually control robots that can walk right into a fire right into dangerous environments and do the work they have to do. For example, at Fukushima in Japan, we have a raging nuclear meltdown, three of them simultaneously going on even as we speak. Even as we speak, they still have not yet gotten control of three melted cores. They put in robots, all fail. Every robot has failed because they're simply not sophisticated enough. So why not put a robot in that is controlled mentally? And this could be the future of your classroom. Remember when we were kids? We used to play hooky all the time. I mean, come on, fess up, right? You would ask your mother, Mom, can you write a note saying little Johnny is sick today? Well, this is the future. In the future, you'll have a surrogate. The surrogate will have your video image on it. You'll be sick in bed. The teacher will see your image in the surrogate sitting in your chair, and you will see the teacher in your surrogate. This is the future of education. Isn't the future wonderful? <laughs> we'll never be able to play hooky ever again. You will never miss a day of class because you or your surrogate is always sitting in your chair, diligently taking notes, just like we all did when we were little, right? Yeah. And this could be the future of the internet. The internet today is in your glasses. Google glasses, you can recognize people's faces. And a biography appears next to the person's face. And if they speak Chinese to you, we can now create internet so that translations occur as somebody speaks Chinese to you, you will see their biography and their translation underneath their image. How many times have you been at a conference like this and you bump into an old friend and you say to yourself, who is this person? <laughs> Jim, John, Jake, I know this person. In the future, your contact lens will say, it's Jim, stupid. <laughs> you see him every year at the National Book Festival. Here's his complete biography, even if he speaks Chinese to you. And let's say afterwards, you're just shooting the bowl and there's a cocktail party. A cocktail party with some very important people there, but you don't know who they are. In the future, 
You will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. So these, cocktail, these contact lenses will change everything. And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> they will blink and see all the answers to the final exam right there in their contact lens. And who's the next person to buy internet contact lenses? President Barack Obama. So he doesn't have to have these damn teleprompters in front of him giving his speech. And who's the third person to buy internet contact lenses? Vice President Joe Biden, so that he's always on message, as they say. <laughs> so you can see that the potential of this technology is like living in the matrix. When you walk into a room, you'll see identification of all the objects. If you're in Rome and you see nothing but the ruins of the Roman Empire, you'll see the Roman Empire resurrected right in your contact lens as you walk through the ruins of Rome. And if you bargain with the merchants in the bazaar, you'll see subtitles translating Italian into English. So in the future, everyone will be connected. This is called, okay, these are emergency workers of the future, surrogates controlled mentally by the mind. So this is the prospect of exoskeletons, the prospect of surrogates, the prospect of literally living in the matrix. And then, this is the possibility of retrieving memories. Last year, for the first time in history, scientists at Wake Forest University recorded the world's first memory. They took a mouse. The mouse had a hippocampus that was wired up. Memories are made through the hippocampus. They tape recorded, just tape recorded the impulses across the hippocampus. And then later, when the mouse forgot the task, they reinserted the memory into the mouse. Bingo! On the first try, the mouse remembered the task. And at MIT, just a few months later, they duplicated the experiment and uploaded a false memory into a mouse. And last week, last week, the United States Pentagon announced a $40 million project to create in four years four years a memory chip, a memory chip for veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan to enhance their memories. And like I said, in the future, you will be able to relive the vacation you never had. <laughs> and beyond that, at Berkeley, where I got my PhD years ago, you can now photograph a thought. This was considered way into science fiction, and now we do it every day. Here's how we do it. Um, he, this picture here shows a brain scan using MRI. It converts blood flow into 30,000 dots as you look at a picture. Then using MRIs, we're able to massage this picture, analyze the dots, and create an image. So from the brain, from all these 30,000 dots, we create a picture of what you're looking at. Look at this picture very carefully. You're looking at some of the first photographs of human thought ever photographed in history. You see a picture of Steve Martin, and next to it is a fuzzy picture reconstructed from the human mind. Amazing. If you're looking at the Mona Lisa, the computer will reconstruct a crude picture of the Mona Lisa from your blood flow inside the brain. And then when you fall asleep, it records your memories of your dream. In the future, you may wake up hit a button, and see the dream that you had the previous night. And we could also begin to understand things like lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is something right out of science fiction. It's when you are conscious while you are dreaming. It was once considered a fake, but with blood flow experiments in Max Planck University in Leipzig, Germany, we proved it's real. You can now control your dream while you are dreaming and prove it using MRI flows. How many people here, just by the way, have ever had an episode of lucid dreaming where you knew you were dreaming while you were dreaming? Ever raise your hand. Hundreds of people have done it. You can train yourself on the internet. There are ways to train yourself to become a lucid dreamer, and it's true. These are pictures, pictures of an elephant, pictures of a human, and then on the right is the computer reconstruction of what you're looking at.
And the big one is mental illness. Why is President Barack Obama, why is the European Union dumping a billion dollars into the Brain Initiative to solve one of our most ancient diseases, mental illness? Millions of Americans at some point in their life will suffer some episode of depression, mental illness, anxiety. What is mental illness? Well, for example, schizophrenia is when you hear voices. That's called madness, when you hear voices. However, when you put this person in an MRI scan, you find something interesting. The left part of the brain lights up because that part of the brain talks to itself. When you talk to yourself, the left part of the brain generates voices. That's why you talk to yourself. But the front part of your brain is your conscious brain. It knows that the left part of the brain is talking to itself. In these people, when they have an episode of schizophrenia, the left part of the brain lights up without their permission. They are unaware that they are literally talking to themselves. And you see that now for the first time in history, looking at blood flow of a schizophrenic mind. And we can now look at Joan of Arc and many historical figures to this light. It turns out that a certain fraction of people with epileptic lesions also suffer from hyper-religiosity. They think they are talking to God. Everything that happens is because it was meant to be that way. If somebody falls, it's because it was meant to be that way. And we think that Joan of Arc was not schizophrenic. Joan of Arc suffered from hyper-religiosity. And we can actually induce this with a helmet. We can actually put a helmet that shoots radio into the temporal cortex of the brain and induce the feeling of being in the presence of God. This is called a God helmet. And we can actually induce this feeling. So scientists, of course, we like to experiment. We put an atheist inside the God helmet. <laughs> that atheist was um, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and we put Richard Dawkins in the God helmet. And afterwards, we asked him, do you feel the presence of God? And he said, no, no, no God. <laughs> they put a Catholic nun in the God helmet. And the Catholic nun was sh her belief shaken because you can induce the feeling of God with a switch? And she said, no. She said, God made us with a telephone system so that we can communicate with God. You can't win. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me wind up. Super genius is yet one of many things we talk about in the book. Uh, some people have had a bullet go through the left temporal lobe. Uh, one person had a swimming pool accident where he injured the left temporal lobe on hitting the bottom of a pool. Afterwards, both of them emerged as super mathematical geniuses. So tonight, when you go home, do not pick up a hammer. Do not hit the left part of your brain thinking you're going to become the next Einstein. But it has happened several times in the past. This individual can take one helicopter ride over the harbor in New York and draw the entire entire skyline of New York City, down to every window, and you can see it at JFK Airport. Next time you land in Terminal 1 of JFK, look up, and you'll see this huge mural drawn from memory by this individual. And of course, Einstein is the greatest genius of modern times. His brain is still with us today. We have his brain. It is different. Not by much, but it is different. It's at Princeton Hospital. Well, I'm sort of running out of time, so let me just wind up on one note. And if you have further questions, you can read my book. <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, my role model was Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I will be the great Einstein giving the speech that you've given so many times. And you can put on my hat. You can put on my uniform and be my chauffeur. So they switched places. This went along famously until one day. Until one day a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. 
Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.